So hello, hello, welcome everyone. Very happy to see so many familiar faces here, uh, mostly students. So uh, my name is Balázs Bartóki Gönci. I'm director of the Institute of Space and Policy here at the university. And um, today we'll talk about outer space. Outer space, which becomes a domain more and more important for the humanity itself. It's not just about space exploration. It's more about the use of outer space, how we use it for humanity, for the life on Earth. So for telecommunications, meteorology, Earth observation, navigation, and we are just entering a new space era. Maybe some of you have visited my lecture on space law, so you know that, that there are more and more nations getting out into outer space. There are more and more new technologies. We want to go back to the moon, and we want to stay on the moon. There's a new competition for the moon. We want to go to the Mars within a few decades with, with humans, and there are more and more security challenges. Now we have 6,000 satellites approximately into our, in our space. There are plans to have more than 400,000 satellites in the near future on low Earth orbits. There are more and more problems and probably conflicts mirrored from the Earth's conflicts. So low has a very important role to keep space peaceful and secure. So therefore, we invited someone, an expert, a perfect legal expert from the United Nations who will speak about these issues with special emphasis on the national space laws, on how states regulate the space activities. So let me introduce you, uh, Ms. Rosanna Hoffman, who's a legal expert at the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, so-called UNOSA, where she is the head of the UN Space Law for New Space Sectors program. Rosanna Hoffman was previously uh, Secretary General of the ESA Space Law Center, She's a recognized international expert on the subject. She holds a BA in political science and governance from the University of Vienna and obtained a law degree. She also holds an MA in international relations from the Donau Universitat Krems. Previously, she worked for the Austrian Federal Ministry of Justice and the University of Vienna. So now I ask uh, Rosanna to make a presentation on the issue and then we'll have time to question and answer. So I encourage you. Uh, to prepare with questions. Thank you. Rosanna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So I'll, uh, I'll stand and, and walk a bit in the front, but at some point my feet might hurt and I'll, and I'll sit. <laughs> but no, thank you, Balash, so much for that, for that very kind introduction and, and, and thank you so much for the invitation, of course, to the organizers uh, for me to, to be here. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a topic that uh, is very near and dear to, to me. Uh, this is a topic I talk about on a, on a daily basis, in fact. This is my work. So uh, very, very excited to be able to share this with you. And, and as Balash said, if you have any questions at the end, uh, uh, please do, do ask that. We, we, we have saved enough time for that. Um, maybe just briefly a question uh, from me to you. Um, I've, I've heard that maybe some of you have, in fact, uh, heard a presentation on the topic of space law. Is there anyone who's never heard that there exists something like space law? Raise your hands. So everyone has heard that there exists space law. Okay, that's, that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> it's a success. Indeed, it is. It is. That's, that's fantastic. Believe me, when I do these lectures at other universities, more than half of the students have never heard of this term. So this is truly a, a success of, of this university. Um, but I will still uh, give you a bit of an introduction to space law in general. If it's a repetition for you, I, I apologize, uh, but maybe it's also good. Maybe you have an exam coming up or something on, on the topic. And then what I'll be doing more into depth is, uh, is national space law. Why? Uh, Balash already mentioned this, but my job at the UN is to help emerging spacefaring nations, and Hungary counts as such a nation, with their national space law and policy. And why are we doing that? Uh, you might know, of course, that we have uh, nations that are, that are widely already since the 50s and 60s engaging in space activities. And they have national space laws in that regard. But now we've come into a completely new space era. It is really new. Uh, five, ten years back, uh, uh, the, the, the way we see space activities being, being done as of today 
was completely different. So we have more than 70 states that are considered emerging spacefaring nations. So they're new to the space arena. They maybe started with CubeSats. They're now planning for maybe their first telecommunication satellite, as, as Hungary is. They're planning their first Earth observation satellite. Maybe they have an astronaut planned. And now they're finding out, slowly but surely, that they need to regulate these activities. So. That is what, what we do at the UN. We try to help these countries with their national space law and policy. But before I get ahead of myself, I already mentioned a few aspects of, of the slide. But traditionally, when we talk about space law, so the five UN space treaties, and Hungary has in fact ratified four of the UN space treaties, and we'll look at them uh, in, in a brief moment. When we talk about international law, international space law, the subject of international law is states, and to some degree international organizations, but it's not private entities. It's not industry, it's not uh, uh, you know, a startup that is currently manufacturing a satellite, it's states. States are the ones that are obliged to adhere to specific principles within these treaties. And as I've already mentioned, the main actors in outer space in the 50s, 60s, 70s were states. That was fine. It was fine that we had international law that regulated these activities because it was states participating in these activities and to some degree international organizations. But more and more, uh, we see that it's no longer states or to a lesser degree, it's de facto non-governmental entities. It's industry. And there are also international organizations that have been privatized. Uh, look at UMET, uh, not UMETSAT, in fact, that is an international organization, but UTELSAT, for example, is now private, is now no longer subject of international law. So you need national law to be able to regulate this. So that's the new space actors that we have. So often I get a question when we do these advisory services for states, um, why do we need space activities? Well, here in the slide, you see space activities are indispensable, they're innovative, they're inspirational, they're complex, they're expensive, they're risky. But why do we need it? And maybe I'm, I'm speaking to the wrong audience here and you know all of this already, but you use, you use the services of space activities every single day. I see some of you on your phone right now, you're using those services. You're using those services when you're driving in your car, through navigation. You use those services when you're on your phone, using internet. Uh, you use those services maybe uh, in, your, in your agriculture industry especially. And, and when it comes to emerging spacefaring nations, especially those aspects of agriculture, of, of maritime aspects, of, of rising sea levels, etc. These are aspects where you use satellite services, where you use Earth observation data, for example. And that's where this word of indispensable comes from. So you need space activities more and more. But to be able to continue to use these, uh, these services, we need to act responsibly, we need to act sustainably. We often say that uh, space is, is, um, is unlimited, it never ends, but specific orbits are not unlimited. Specific spaces within these orbits are not unlimited. And that we need to act, and especially there we need to act uh, sustainably. And there you have the regulative, regulative force of law. Okay. I think I've, I've, I've said a lot of these aspects, maybe um, one point that I would like to mention in the slide, and it's again the, the reason for the need for national space law. So in the 50s and 60s is when the treaties that we talk about, the five UN treaties, also in the 70s in, in, in that aspect, but especially the Outer Space Treaty from 1967 was established at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, so by member states of that committee, currently 102. And just to give some context here, Hungary has been a member of that committee since 1959. The committee exists since 1958, so one of the founding member states of that, of that committee, in fact. 
But the point that I'm trying to make here is that when states uh, were discussing what the content of the treaty should be and whether non-governmental entities, so the actors we're speaking about today when we speak about space activities, would be allowed to participate in, in space activities, many states said no. This was in the 50s and 60s, so there were not that many non-governmental entities around in this, in this respect. They said no, space should only be accessible by states. We do not want industry, we do not want non-governmental entities to participate in any type of space activity. But then there were other states that said, no, nah, we do actually want it. It's good for our economy, it's good for, for technology, advancement of technology, we do need it. So then they had to come up with a compromise because several states thought it's too dangerous if you let non-governmental entities participate in space activities. Space activities are inherently uh, considered dangerous. So much can go wrong, so much damage can be caused that is so expensive. Um, so then they came up with a compromise. And the compromise is in Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. It says that states need to continuously supervise and prior to this, authorize activities by non-governmental entities. So that means the compromise was, fine, we, we let non-governmental entities participate in space activities, but if they do, then states will ultimately be responsible for that activity and liable. So what does it mean? If a Hungarian company goes up to space and then uh, crashes into a different satellite, let's say the Hungarian government was not involved whatsoever in this exercise. It's purely a Hungarian entity. Then it is not that entity that is responsible under international law. Why? Because subject of international space law is the state, is, the, is, is, a, is a country. So Hungary will be responsible for this accident, for any damage caused by this accident, and then also liable. And that is why in Article 6 it is so, so, so clear that states need to, it's an obligation also for Hungary, as a, as, as a state who has ratified the treaty to, previ to, to authorize this activity and the, during the lifetime of the activity, continuously supervise it. So I've already been talking about, um, about these treaties, maybe just so you, so you also understand uh, in, in, in respect to Hungary, the first four treaties, the Outer Space Treaty, the Rescue and Return Agreement, the Liability Convention and the Registration Convention are four of the five UN treaties that Hungary has ratified. So therefore, it has clear obligations within those treaties that it has to adhere by. These declarations and principles on the right-hand side, they're non-legally binding. That doesn't mean that they're not being implemented on a national level, but they're not legally binding in an international uh, legal sense. And then there's other instruments. So we always say with space law, and, and probably Balash has mentioned this, I'm sure in his presentation, that the treaty making era was the 50s and 60s. And imagine, this was the time of, of, of the Cold War. And the two biggest, and to date still probably biggest spacefaring nations, were at war with each other. And they were still able to come to an agreement and come up with the treaty here, the Outer Space Treaty, that is the so-called Magna Charta of, of, of outer space activities. But, okay, the treaty-making era is, is in the past. What we're now seeing more and more is that states are still willing to cooperate with one another. States are very much willing to discuss topics of importance, uh, long-term sustainability of space, space debris, space resources, but no longer put on paper anything legally binding. They rather put on paper principles and guidelines, so soft law, if you want to call it as such, non-legally binding instruments. A very, very important tool under international law. It has legal effect, but it's not legally binding. And um, here, especially important are the space debris mitigation guidelines, and the 21 long-term sustainability guidelines. Why do I say especially important? Because these two 
uh, non-legally binding documents, we see more and more states implemented into their national law because they see that space is not infinite. They see that there is a clear need to make sure that debris is, space debris is mitigated, that uh, maybe even at some point remediation efforts, so bringing space debris out of space needs to be, needs to be made and that space needs to be used sustainably. And why are the recommendations on national legislation in, in fat letters? That is because that is what I do. Um, there in these recommendations, and we'll, we'll come to that later, uh, seven key elements were, were, uh, were adopted by the committee, seven key elements that states thought are important that every country implement into their national space law. All right, so um, what is the reason for having a national space law or what is the reason for having space law in general? I've mentioned many of these already. We, we want to prevent outer space to become an area of conflict. It's called the peaceful uses of outer space. You want to often, and this goes hand in hand with having a national space law, you want to strengthen your possibility of cooperating with other states. States are often much more willing to cooperate with a state that has ratified the treaties because they understand that that state uh, clearly understands that it has obligations under international law and, 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 and understands these. And you want to make sure that the benefits in outer space, and there are several, uh, are distributed fairly. All right, and I think this is the last slide, yes, on space law in general and then, and then briefly on national space law. And I hope we're still good on time. A question, another one that we get a lot is whether law or space law uh, might actually hinder industry of, of uh, wanting to develop or wanting to uh, start setting foot in a country. Um, it's often seen like that, right? Law can be very restrictive and, and, and might not want to uh, necessarily attract investment. But the argument that we give over and over and over again, and that has really shown to, to, be, to be correct, is that space law, in fact, needs to be seen as an enabler. Your industry, and I'm sure that, that many of you might already be involved in some way, maybe at some point you want to, want to go towards industry in your, in your personal career, but industry wants to know that there is some legal clarity and they want to have predictability. Those are the two main points when it comes to space activities. Because space activities are so expensive. Manufacturing satellites are so expensive. And you want legal clarity and predictability because you will not manufacture a satellite that, for example, has um, no re-entry mechanisms. And then you go to a country that clearly states in its, in its uh, licensing process that your satellite would have to re-enter the atmosphere within 25 years. But now you used all this money, and in the end you can't do anything with that satellite. So having this legal clarity, making sure that you as a country, or as a, let's take the European Space Agency as an example. The European Space Agency is 22 countries, and even they have very clear rules and requirements, safety requirements, safety standards when it comes to uh, uh, satellites. Uh, and there, in fact, they do imply uh, uh, the 25-year re-entry rule. Now they're planning a five-year re-entry rule, and by 2030, they want a so-called zero debris approach. And all of these things are needed for companies to have legal clarity because that means that technology will go also where the law goes and vice versa. Of course, the law follows technology. So it's seen as an enabler. And maybe one more point, not only obligations, but rights. I've mentioned now the Outer Space Treaty and, and, and the subsequent treaties, there's the obligations, obligations, obligations. But Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty actually gives states rights. It says a state has the freedom to use outer space. So first and foremost, by ratifying the treaty, by being part of this collaborative environment, this multilateral environment at the UN also. 
you have a freedom, first and foremost, to use outer space. And then, of course, with a few obligations here and there. Okay. Uh, many of these points I've already mentioned, so I won't, I won't go through them point by point. I've mentioned the need for national space law to make sure that one is in compliance with the obligations set forth in the treaties. You would want to prevent harmful consequences of space activities. I've mentioned that space activities can be extremely dangerous. Uh, this is also not exaggerating in any way or form. It is dangerous. And by having specific rules and regulations and safety standards in place, you avoid harmful consequences. Consistency and predictability, I mentioned it. A practical regulatory system, what does this mean? This means that you, for example, as a state, would want to have a system in place that is easily understandable to your industry. Again, you want to attract industry, right? and also easily uh, usable. So for example, if a, if a, country, if a, um, a company uh, requests a license, a license to, to, uh, to operate, then it has to be easily understandable and easily doable. These are all things that, that, a, that a country can look into implementing. And the last point here also I mentioned, regional and international cooperation. It is very, very, very clear to us, and we see it at the UN, at the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, we see that cooperation between states are much more welcome when a state knows that another state has a national space law. Another state is clear of its obligations. Okay, so this is actually just repetition of what I just said. So I'll jump over it, so we save a bit of time. So what is a national space law? Uh, this is another one, and there is actually no definition of what a national space law is, surprise. There's actually a lot of definitions missing under space law in general, but generally we say it's the sum of all domestic legal instruments pertaining to space activities. This could, however, also include the legal aspects of establishing a space agency or the legal aspects of establishing a spaceport. But when we really talk about national space law, the, 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 the crux of it is the implementation of this Article 6 I mentioned at the beginning. Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, the implementation of this very, very clear and concise obligation to authorize and continuously supervise. So to have some type of mechanism in place, either in your law or your regulatory framework or in your licensing process, that this aspect is implemented. And also here, so there's no prescribed method of national space law. It can be a plethora of acts. If you look at the French uh, space law, uh, we're not talking about one act. I think it's seven or something. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's many. If you look at the Austrian one, it's clearly defined. It's one, uh, um, one law. And, uh, and, there's, and there's others. And I'll show you later on a different slide, uh, a database that you can use should you want to do more research in this area, should you find the presentation so exciting that in the evening you want to learn more about it, uh, uh, there's a database with all of these uh, national space laws combined. Oh, and maybe one more thing. I mentioned it could be legal aspects of a spaceport or establishing a space agency, that that could also be seen as a, as a, as a national space law. But I don't know how many of you are, are lawyers or studying law, but there are also other legal aspects to consider when you're planning a space activity or when you're licensing a space activity. So whether you're an operator or whether you're uh, in, in the authorizer in this case, the authority or the, the ministry. And it's that there are other aspects, tax, custom, expert control, uh, especially expert control. No part of a satellite will be, I mean, maybe, but very seldomly will a satellite only be from, or the parts of a satellite only be from one country. There will be different parts from different countries and then you'll have matters of expert control that are, that are important to consider. Also uh, intellectual property. So there's many aspects that you will have to uh, look into. Okay, 
more important is this one. Um, I mentioned these seven key elements. So there was a working group at the legal subcommittee. And for those of you who do not know what the legal subcommittee is, the UN in 1958 established an ad hoc committee on the peaceful uses of outer space, which Hungary is a member of since 1959, as I mentioned. And that ad hoc committee became a permanent committee in 1959 and has two subcommittees, the legal subcommittee and the scientific and technical subcommittee. And all of these three committees, the main and the two subcommittees, meet every year. So the scientific and technical one and the legal one already took place. And in two weeks, in fact, the main committee will take place. And it always takes place in Vienna. So where our offices are, UNOSA's offices. Because UNOSA, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, is the secretariat of that large committee with 102 member states. And the legal subcommittee of that main committee came up with a report in 2012 with seven key elements that it found paramount to be considered when establishing a national space law. And they are scope of application. So what is a space activity, for example? What will this law apply to? Does it apply to the launch, the operation, the launch site? the manufacturing, that is the scope of application. Authorization and licensing, so, and the continuing supervision, so that paramount article six. Registration, why registration? You saw on the slide, a few slides back, that there are five treaties. One of those treaties is the registration convention, and states have an obligation to not only establish a national registry with all of their space objects, also here important to note space object, we're not talking about satellites only, any type of space object. So to have a national registry on space objects and notify the UN of their space objects. So that is under registration, then liability and insurance, very important. Safety, what do we mean under safety? Under that terminology, all of these aspects I mentioned before, space debris mitigation, long-term sustainability of outer space activities, all of that would fall under the aspect of safety, so safety standards. And more and more important, transfer of ownership. Those were the seven key elements. So how does it normally look like with uh, authorization and continuing supervision. So this is actually, by the way, uh, just an example. This is from the UK uh, license form. It's an online licensing form. Uh, you have different types of things that you can click and then it opens, uh, so w whether you're, you're planning a launch facility or whether you're planning to be an operator of a space light, it really depends. So here it's about being a launch operator, right? You have a space flight launch operator. That is the licensing form to be a space flight launch operator. So you have to fill that out. And then uh, the UK uh, authority decides whether you get a license to, to be that or not. And I mean, generally, if they say no, it doesn't mean never. It means there's some aspects that you maybe forgot to think about, some safety standards you didn't consider. And this is how Article 6 often is implemented through a licensing process. So similar to, to getting a, a license to, to drive a car, driving a car is dangerous, uh, we all know that. Accidents happen all the time, people die, it uh, costs a lot of money. The same with space activities. So you need to get a license to do it. And now briefly on, on the project that I, that I had. So we spoke about the importance of a national space law I think it's very clear why it is important. And therefore, since 2019, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs established a specific project because more and more countries really needed help. And right now we have over 50 countries requesting specific services, so services by the UN to help them establish either a national space law or a national policy or both help them implement it into a regulatory framework and, and uh, even go so far that they say, listen, we, we, we have a draft in place, but could you help us persuade our politicians to actually bring it through parliament because they don't actually see why this is important at all. Uh, 
And then that's what we do. We try to help them as far as we can. This is the method we use. It's very adaptable. If a state says, we actually don't need stage one and stage two, we've identified all of this. We already have a draft in place. Please help us identify gaps. We did this three weeks ago. We were in Kenya. Uh, the Kenyan Space Agency had already come up with a fantastic draft of a national space law. What they needed from us was to help them identify gaps that they had. So we did something similar to a moot court case. I don't know if anyone's participated in a moot court. Do you know what a, what a moot court is? Maybe raise your hand if you don't know what it is and I'll briefly, okay. Okay, so a moot court case is a, is a mock case, so a fake case that you have in front of a court. Uh, when you talk about international law cases, often it's in front of the International Court of Justice. So even in a case, should a state, by the way, not uh, uh, um, comply with, with their obligations under, under the space treaties that I mentioned, another state could go to the International Court of Justice and bring a claim against them. So this moot court case, or this, this fake case, is used with these countries to say, look, uh, we give you an example, your satellite or debris of your satellite, it's no longer functioning, crashes into a different satellite. And then, oh no, terrible, it actually comes tumbling down to earth, and for some reason it didn't burn up completely. And then it crashed into a house on a neighboring country. And now you're liable because damage happened. Uh, thankfully, nobody died, but you know, a house got damaged and that cost a lot of money. And also, there was some really important uh, materials on that satellite that you want to get back. So how do you get that satellite back? Have you considered the rescue and return agreement where it's also about returning space objects? And all of these aspects, right? And they use their draft law to try to solve that case, and by doing that, and this is just one example, there's lots of small cases that we do with them. By doing that, they might uh, see that there are some aspects that they maybe forgot. All right, we do it with a questionnaire, etc. cetera. I, this, this, this goes a bit too much into detail, but this might be interesting to you. So if you think, wow, this was really great what Rosanna said, I, I'm, I'm not falling asleep yet, um, there's an e-learning course that we launched just a few months ago, and it's free for everyone. It's four modules, and, uh, and I'm not sure if, if, if you can get these slides afterwards, but you see the link here, and just Google UNOSA e-learning space law, and you'll find it, so it's not, you know, it's not impossible to find. But it's four modules, it's de facto one afternoon. You know, I think the weekend's gonna be super rainy, so you might have time and, and want, to, want to spend an afternoon doing that and learn more about, about space law. And again, like I said, it's, it's for free and it's done very interactively. So it, it should be fun. And then I also mentioned the database. Uh, remember when I gave those examples of, of different types of national space law? So what we did, uh, and of course states have to, agree to us doing that. So we don't have the national laws of all countries in the world yet. We are trying to, but we, of course, again, as I said, need to get the okay to do it. But it's a collection of all national space laws that are shared with us by countries. And what we, however, did here, because something similar already existed on the UN website, what's new with the ASTRO database is that it's categorized. So I don't know, maybe somebody here is planning a PhD or is doing a PhD or is doing a master thesis, let's say on space debris. Um, and I, <laughs> in fact, I'm doing a PhD in space debris, uh, on the topic of space debris, and in the past, I had to open every single national law and read through it from A to Z to find that little, little article that refers to aspects of space debris mitigation. Here it's categorized, so you just click on the topic space debris and it shows you all of the laws and regulations pertaining to that topic. Or your topic may be space resources, or I don't know, authorization. So that I find is uh, extremely useful. Okay, uh, 
Again, just because that's my project, these are the technical advisory missions that we did in, uh, in the past. So it's actually incorrect that it's written in 2022 because there's also some from 2020. In there you see it's very few in 21. That is also due to COVID. Um, this project is not meant to be done virtually. We do need to go to the country. We do need to have meetings with all of the authorities, the ministries, the universities, uh, and we need to get all of the stakeholders involved. And these are ones coming up. Kenya, we uh, already did. 